well, it's early, and we're already late. So um, I'm Mac Newbold. This is um, Kanban, the other Agile. I guess um, since they're not here, we will thank our sponsors. Uh, our room sponsor is UVU. Yay, UVU. So thank you for, um, thanks for coming. I know it's early and it's Saturday. Um, I hope you're not as tired as I am. So um, Kanban, I want to talk a little bit about software development methodologies, what those are, and um, we'll talk a little bit about Agile Scrum, and uh, because it's very related to Kanban. Kanban is also an Agile, and, um, and then basically why Kanban might be a fit for your team, and then how you'd go about implementing it. Feel free to stop me at any time if you've got questions or, uh, or anything like that. Um, first of all, how many of you are already using what you'd call a, a methodology um, that has like a, a name that you could put to it? You're getting started? Or what are you, what are you using? Uh, our, our parent wants us to use Scrum. Okay. But we think Kanban may be a better approach. Yeah? That makes sense. I, I was using Scrum before we tried Kanban. Um, Anybody else? How many are, are doing Agile already? Are you? Um, I, the company I just started with two weeks ago, they're implementing Kanban. Oh, okay. So. Cool. So they're already rolling with it, and you want to find out more about what it is and why and yeah. that kind of stuff? Okay. Anybody else? Anyone? Okay, so methodologies. It's basically it's a label for a process. Uh, nothing fancy. It's just, it's just a label that helps people to identify, oh, that's how you're doing it. Um, there have been historically some well-known methods. Uh, most of them have been pretty common despite some well-known flaws. You know, there are a lot of different ways that are more popular now and offer some better alternatives. Everyone heard of waterfall? Made fun of it at some point or another? Uh, basically, you figure out the requirements, you do the design, you implement it, you verify it, and, you, and then you go into maintenance mode. Uh, it's very linear. Uh, there are kind of some obvious downfalls to that. If you do any one of those wrong, there's not any accommodation for that or for going back and fixing it or, um, or making sure you got it right in the first place. So that gave rise to iterative methods that do go back and uh, revisit some of the other stages down the road. Uh, Agile is a, is a form of an iterative method. Instead of one big waterfall for the whole project, uh, sometimes they use a series of smaller waterfalls. Sometimes there are, uh, there are some other variations they add to it. Uh, most of it is in, uh, in hopes of resolving some of the problems you run into with the straightforward, most obvious approaches. Um, agile development is a very trendy one right now, and with good reason. It's uh, closely related to both the iterative and chaos models of software development. Um, Scrum is the most popular variant. Basically, you divide your time up into sprints. You plan a sprint at a time. So you're looking out usually between one and four weeks. I think one, and one to two weeks is the most common sprint sizes I've seen. Uh, you build out what you plan. You demonstrate it um, with the goal that your sprint ends up with some working software. And you review how that sprint went. And then you start over again. So it, it iterates through that cycle um, indefinitely. Uh, the reason I say it's related to the chaos model is there's another model uh, that I like to call the chaos model where you don't plan, you just build stuff. And that has some obvious flaws too. So um, Agile kind of combines the minimal planning with uh, get something done and have something you can test, that you can look at, that you can try out and then refine it. You know, build more onto it, change the way you did things before from what you've learned from from building it. One of the big things that Agile kind of brought to the forefront is that there are things you don't know about the software you're trying to build until after you try it. And so trying it sooner gets you that information earlier. Uh, having a working prototype early in the process has some, some big advantages. So usually this leads to productive sprints, but in the big picture, there is a penalty for avoiding any long range planning and analysis. It's not to say that you're, you couldn't have a sprint that's goal rather than actually building stuff was building a plan. 
but in practice I don't see that very often. So I've mentioned planning a few times. There are some conundrums that come up with planning and it, it becomes a sticking point. How much planning do you do? When do you do it? Uh, how do you feed that back into the rest of your plan, in, into your process? When you underplan, you end up building before you know what you're really supposed to be building. And uh, you, know, you start running down the road without knowing where the final destination really is. And then usually that leads to rebuilding a lot as new information becomes available. You start refining your plan, and that means you've got to go back and fix stuff that you've done a different way. Eventually the practicalities of that get in the way where really, you know, now with what you know, you should have architected it this way, but you've got so much code that's built and working around this other way that sometimes you take some shortcuts and you don't go back and re-architect completely because you don't want to throw away all that work you already did. Uh, on the other hand, you can also overplan. Um, you'll delay implementation until you know every last little detail. And sometimes if you take that too far, you can leave your team idle um, and, and end up debating just really minor details that don't really matter in the end um, that you could really figure out a lot quicker by just trying it and seeing. You know, a half a day project can tell you, does method A work or not, instead of basing a whole plan around something that you're not totally sure on. So I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's a clear answer other than to try and seek a balance between the two. The middle ground seems to be where people are happiest. Sidestep, lean manufacturing. Um, let's talk about cars. Toyota. Um, they, for decades, have been working on this system they call the Toyota Production System that has a lot of principles and lessons that we can apply to software development. Uh, building cars is different than software. In addition to time and effort that goes into building something, you also have material costs. So rework is a very big problem in their world. Uh, it is a big problem in our world too, uh, but usually we don't have you know, sunk costs from trying something and, and then wasting those materials by doing it wrong. Uh, do it right the first time is important for them. I like to make do it, do it right the first time important in the software I build too. Uh, a lot of what the Toyota production system focuses on is eliminating different kinds of waste. Uh, anything that's not adding value to your final product should be eliminated. It's just waste. You're doing extra things that aren't adding value. Uh, one of their biggest wastes was overproduction. Uh, another one is time on hand. Uh, and that relates to number five, stock at hand. Whenever you've got things waiting somewhere, they're getting older, they're getting out of date, they're getting stale, they might develop problems by, by sitting there too long, or they might become obsolete. Um, transportation. Moving stuff from one point to another doesn't add value in the final product. So if you can eliminate it, great. Um, the processing itself, if, you, if you're doing things in your processing that are wasting effort, you know, it's not doing any good, just get rid of it. Uh, stock at hand inventory becomes a big part of why Kanban came about, and we'll talk more about that. Movement, so any additional motion. Uh, for example, if you had your workstation set up so that your keyboard were over here and your testing station were over here, every time you've got to go back and forth, back and forth, adds time. It, it doesn't add any value, uh, so get rid of it. And then one of the big ones that especially affects software is making defective products. doesn't add value to the end product to build it wrong before you build it right. So this, this works for cars and software. So the Toyota Way started to outline some things that they could do better. These are kind of seven points that they, that they learned that, uh, that really have a lot to do with the way we build software. They found that if they use a consistent process, it helps uncover problems. Because as long as they're following that process, if there's something that's not fitting in their process, something that's not working, it becomes evident much more quickly than if you've got people who are silently, oh, you know what, this one's an exception, I'm going to handle it differently. Oh, this one, oh, you know what, really we should do this this other way. If the people keep circumventing the system and they don't follow the consistency of the standard, then uh, some of those problems get hidden and don't get dealt with appropriately. Uh, they started using what they call a pull system to avoid overproduction. Uh, this is where just-in-time production came, uh, came into being. They don't produce part X that's needed by step Y until the people doing step Y say, hey, we need more of part X. 
there will be a buffer, obviously, but, um, but they said, don't make it a big buffer. Make it enough of a buffer that you can give them enough time to produce more of part X before you run out, but um, don't overproduce. Just build what you need, no more, uh, because things change. Uh, a big part for them was leveling out the workload. They had to make their whole process be divided into steps that were roughly uniform in the amount of time they took and uh, so that they could produce work units consistently across all of the different steps in their process. A big thing that they found was that standardization, standardization lets you work on continuously improving your process. You might have heard of Kaizen. It's a philosophy of always making things better always looking back at what you've been doing, how it's working, and what you might be able to do to improve it. Number six is visual controls. Um, they found that when you can see the control system for your process, it's much more obvious where problems might lie, and it avoids having problems that are hidden, lurking in the shadows. And then uh, number seven is they work to understand issues by uh, doing what they call going to see for yourself. If, if there's a problem, or an issue that you've got to deal with, they, they say, go and find out. That, that doesn't so much relate to Kanban, but it does relate to the way you do your planning and uh, how you get started on your projects. You know, If you want to understand how this department that's asking for this piece of software that you're going to build, if you want to understand how they're working, you know, go look over their shoulders. You know, be, sit in their shoes for a day so you understand what the issue is and, and can build the right solution. So the heart of Kanban is the pull system, leveling the workload, and using the visual controls to, um, to avoid problems. It also relates to the consistency of the process, to the standardization, and, and stopping the production line to build in quality. So they, it, um, one of the quick things they found was that if they keep running the, the production line, even when they know they found a problem with a particular step, they're just sending defective materials further down the road and it becomes harder to fix the further through the process it goes. So in, in the software world, if you find that something in your, in your spec was wrong or something in your graphic design is wrong or something in a, an underlying component is wrong, don't build forward. Stop what you're doing, go back and fix it. If that means going back to replan that to fix that issue and then redesign it to fix the design issue that's related to it and then rebuilding the related components, uh, the sooner you do that, the, the less waste overall you'll end up with. So Kanban. Um, Kanban is a Japanese word that Toyota used in their system. It's kind of caught on as, uh, as a, a word that we use now outside of Japan. But at each station in the assembly line, they had a set of cards. They called them Kanban cards. They would attach them to a bin that they were storing parts in, uh, whatever size or shape that was. And when uh, you know the the materials coming from station A to station B would come in these bins with a Kanban card attached. Station A would not produce more units until they had a Kanban card requesting them, and station B, when they emptied out a bin, would send that Kanban card back to station A saying, "Hey, I'm ready for more stuff." Uh, so you send the card back to the station before you to request more. They return the card with what you requested. A key to this is that you have a fixed number of cards in use. You don't just send them five cards and say, you know what, we got to have more of a buffer. And then you've got a backlog of stuff and you don't have anywhere to put it, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, and, and the other benefit is that these cards are always visible to everyone. Everyone can see where the cards are. You know, we've got six cards at station B, they're working on using those materials. We've got three cards at station A, they're working on producing more. As soon as they get one done, they're going to send it over. So uh, that's, that's part of the visual control. It's really a simple yet elegant uh, solution, in my opinion. Uh, it gives you just-in-time production. The prior step only builds as much as you need when you need it. It levels out the flow of demand. So if station B is going to process three units a week, then station A also knows they need to be uh, they'll be expecting about three cards a week and they'll be producing enough to fill the need of three for three cards a week, three units. It keeps the inventory in the system low. So there's not buildups of materials because you've only got X number of cards in circulation to begin with. So you're never going to have, 
even if station A gets completely caught up and station B completely stopped working, you'd still only have six or eight or nine bins of parts sitting there ready um, at any given time. And, and because everyone can see the cards, the status is obvious. Everyone knows what's going on. So come on for software, right? If we follow those principles, we have a number of stations in our workflow. We've got stages, steps. Uh, I put some examples up here. You might have some requirements or some analysis in your planning. You're going to have probably some design, maybe graphics, stuff like that that will get produced. You're going to actually build something. Uh, you might, you know, I like doing code reviews with our guys before stuff goes off to QA. And then uh, usually the end goal is to deploy something. You know, you're going to put publish a solution to you know, publish your software. So in my world, I'm going to imagine that that's three teams. There's one that's doing the requirements analysis and design, a group that's implementing and code reviewing, and then a group that's doing the QA and the deployment. If you have excess inventory at any stage in your software pipeline, that can be bad. If you have plans that are backlogged, they change before you actually get to use them. And so then there was at least some of the work that went into planning those that got wasted. So that's, that's not helpful. If you have a backlog in review and QA, it makes repairs harder because you're building on top of software that hasn't been tested yet. And so you might be running into bugs that they would have caught had they been able to test it sooner. And, and you can fix the problem before it cascades into other issues. Building, uh, building new components that attach to buggy, to buggy components means you're either working around the bugs or, uh, or you're building in new bugs to accommodate the way the other one works. And then a backlog of undeployed work really complicates everything. You've got solutions that customers are asking for, but they're not out there, but they're done and they're tested, but QA just hasn't had time to deploy them, and it, it just creates headaches for everybody. So how does Kanban work? Let's imagine that you're already running, okay? Every team is already working on building, testing, or planning something. So from the builder's perspective, they're going to finish building project A, they're going to send it off to QA. They're going to request a project plan from the designers. They're going to send that Kanban card from that unit of work back to the designers, and then they're going to start work on project B. QA, at the same time, they're testing and deploying project Z. When they ask for more work, they see, oh, project A is ready. All right, they take that off their queue and they start working on it. To the designers, we're working on project C, they hand off that plan, so now it's ready for the builders. And then when they sent back the request for more work, now they start planning project D. So each team is kind of doing its own little process. There's, a, there's three states, basically, in, uh, in the simplest form of Kanban. There's work that needs to be done, you know, stuff that's ready to process, stuff that's being worked on, uh, work, work in progress, and then there's stuff that's complete which depending on where you are in the pipeline, that might be waiting for the next team. It might be deployed uh, when it's done. So visual controls, pretty pictures. Um, they help a lot. So the centerpiece for Kanban when we're using it for software development is what's called the Kanban board. The, uh, the simplest version and still a very common one and a very workable one is sticky notes on a whiteboard. Draw some columns for your different states, you know, to do over here, in progress, done. Sticky notes for every unit of work that you're going to work on. When you need something to do, you go look at the to-do list, grab something, move it to in progress. When you finish, you move it over to the done column. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's each job, each team's job, is to get stuff from, from A to B and, and keeping it in some kind of an in progress list while they're going. So here's an example, right? So up at the top, well, we'll talk about the top later. So they have columns here. There's a column for goals, their story queue. Um, they have an elaboration acceptance step that's a kind of the analysis and planning stage, uh, development, testing, deployment. And then once it's deployed, they consider it done. So you'll notice that there's a finite amount of space in each column. That is, um, that's hard to avoid on a whiteboard, but it's also intentional. You can only have about five things in development at any given time, as reflected by the number five 
down at the bottom of the development column. Uh, they have set a rule that they only want three things at a time in elaboration acceptance. So they have the little blue bars as spots where you can stick a sticky note. Um, they, only, they want five at a time in their story queue. So everything that's not in their story queue stays out of the way in the goals column. If you have something new, it goes in the goals. You can prioritize it. You can move it above the other ones if you need to. But it doesn't come into the story queue until you've got room for it. So they're not looking at any more than the five that they've got in progress. You had a question? Yeah. Is that an absolute max number or is it an ideal load? Depends on what you want to do. Um, on, on one of the Kanban boards that I use every day, we actually have a max and a minimum. So we don't want any fewer than one task in progress per developer, but we don't want any more than two tasks in progress per developer, at least on average. Uh, we find that when people are working on too many things at once, they all slow down. They get distracted. It's, you know, you're just being pulled in too many directions, and there's a lot of context switching. But we also don't want anybody not working on anything. Um, usually that's mostly a sign of not that they're not doing anything, but that they haven't updated the board. And so you say, hey, you're not working on anything. You need something to do? No, 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 I, I'm working on this. Oh, okay, go move your note. <laughs> go, go move it into progress so, so that we know what's going on. At a glance, you can see which tasks are where and, and what's going on. You had a question? So let's say you have a smaller, smaller team, and maybe some people can work in maybe both functions. Is that okay? Is sure. That? Yeah, yeah, and in fact, fact you, you can, can even use a Kanban board, board just, just for your own individual, individual tasks. tasks. Um, it, it's, it's a little harder when you're splitting across different, uh, different tasks because uh, all of the things in these middle sections here all of these are in progress for some kind of work. Someone is working on them. And if you're the same guy working on all of them, it might be easier to take that one thing and move it through all four steps before you go pick something new up than it is to move everything one step forward. You know, go develop something, go plan something. But, uh, but you can do it. Usually what we end up seeing is our, um, on our board, the columns end up breaking down kind of by team. So each team will have a column that is the stuff they're doing, and then uh, and then there will usually be you know there's a column before theirs and a column after theirs that are kind of the buffers in between. So each it'll kind of go you know we'll have a you know the wish list, we'll have a um, you know planning, you know planning. Actually, rather we'll have the to-do list for the planning team. Sorry, to-do list, planning in progress. Planning done, waiting for development. <coughs> development in progress. Development done, waiting for testing. Testing in progress. Deployed. And, and you know that's their done column. So for us, that's what's worked out well, is to have kind of a, a buffer where the finished work waiting to go into the next stage waits until it, um, it goes on. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, no, I mean, that's a great point. I don't have anything in my slides about it. But uh, part of making this work well, you can't have one sticky note that represents two weeks of work and another sticky note that represents two hours of work. It, it doesn't fly. So you do have to break down your tasks into relatively consistent sizes. That said, I, you know, we found that things go okay when they're as small as an hour or as big as a day on one sticky note. Uh, ideally, I like to keep them to be two to four hours. You know, I, I like to keep mine not more than half a day when I can avoid it. And then um, anything smaller than two hours, as, if there's anything else that's related to it, you know, I, I like to stick those together on, on the same note. So they are about the same size. And then, you know, like they've done here, they've noted that um, if you're here on the process, you've got 18 days before you're going to get to the end with the rate that they're going through their tasks. If you're up here, you're top on the list, ready to go into the next stage, you've only got 14 days. You can actually observe the flow, and there are some charts um, called cumulative, cumulative flow diagrams that show the number of tasks in each stage at any given point. And so you can see what your cycle time is. How long does it take? to get the average task 
from beginning to end of the process, which can really help a lot in establishing expectations with whoever your customers are, whoever's requesting the work. Um, so one thing up at the top that they've done is they've added an expedite lane. Sometimes an emergency comes up, there's something super important that can't, um, they can't wait for everything that's ahead of it in the queue. And so they've got this special lane up there and, and they're using actually red sticky notes um, for those high priority tasks. Usually, you know, it depends on your, on your team and what your protocol is. Sometimes it's drop everything as soon as you see a red tag in your column and work on it. With other teams, it might be finish the one you're working on, but don't start a new one if there's a red one. You know, go to the red one next. Uh, some people also will just kind of insert those into the board. Most boards I've seen, there's some kind of mechanism or process that lets you rearrange the tags so that they don't always necessarily get worked on in the same order uh, that they came into your queue with. You have to be careful not to like leave the same task at the bottom of the list forever, but in practice that ends up working pretty well. Here's an example of a kind of simple electronic Kanban. To-do column, um, there's two doing columns. I'm not sure why they did that. They have, oh, never mind, I am sure. They have a buffer between their to-do and their working. Never mind, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know why they have a buffer for their work in progress because they have two, so they, the two of five in that working column reflects their limit. They don't want more than five things in progress. And then they've got their done column. Um, it looks like they say there are 39 achieved tasks and they're only showing three of them. Um, yeah, it could be. That's a, that's a great point. So if you're, if you're using this on a larger scale, um, especially if you're doing some kind of sprint-like thing along with your Kanban, then uh, you, know, you could have, a, like you said, a plan for the week, stuff I want to get done, stuff I'm really doing right this minute, and, uh, and stuff that's done. You know, along with the size of the tasks, it makes it a lot easier if the tasks aren't um, really, really small. Because the, the smaller your tasks are, the more often you have to go back and update the board, which um, does eventually get to be a significant portion of your time as your tasks get smaller and smaller. Here's a, a more complex and maybe more realistic Kanban board for software development. So they've got 42 tasks that are kind of on the wish list. Um, their development, they say they have a limit of nine uh, between the reopen, in progress, and coded columns. Um, they're currently over that limit, which might be why the bar is, is red. Um, a lot of the electronic Kanban boards will give you some visual feedback whenever you're deviating from your limits. Most of them don't enforce the limits really, really strictly. That usually goes against what people want to do with their board, but they'll at least give you indicators and say, hey, something's wrong. You've got a whole lot of stuff in progress or you know, there's a backlog of things waiting for testing. And the sooner you can see that on your board, the, uh, the sooner you can deal with it um, and the better you can handle it. What's the distinction between coded and testing? Um, if this were my board, coded would be the column for things that we've finished coding them, but the testing team hasn't started testing them yet. So it's basically it's, it's the buffer before, uh, before they start testing it. And then, so if I'm on the testing team, I'm pulling things from coded into testing when I'm working on them, and then when I'm done testing them, I move them over to tested. If I'm development, I'm going to take stuff from the planned column, make it in progress, and then move it to coded. And if something comes up in reopen, I'm going to take from there before I take anything new from planned. They, um, you can see some little pictures up at the top with some numbers. Um, I believe that those are indicating useful things like who is working on how many things. Uh, not sure what the second number would be, but that's, that's what we use on ours. Question? I was thinking about it when we were talking about manufacturing elements, um, and I kind of figured out the corollary uh, is uh, the, the development of How do you deal with situations where things don't go as expected? I was thinking of the truck breaking down that's trying to bring your next three boxes. In this scenario, 
something broke in um, the testing failed, and it has to be sent back somewhere. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a great, great point. point. Yes. To kind of go along with that, we we have a cap on how many things that we can be working on at any given moment, and so this past week we had a situation where our infrastructure team had to implement a new something or other on their end that held up everything that we were working on. We couldn't proceed with anything, and we didn't want to pull anything in because that would have overloaded our our totals. So we were kind of stuck in that situation where. Know what to do. I mean, I yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's tricky, tricky, and um, and, and you know, know the problem becomes very evident that you're starved for work to do because they're, they're not, not you know they, they stop, stop flowing, flowing. Um, and, and, and what to do about, about that really depends a lot on um, your individual circumstances, circumstances. You know, their policies. Would they would they, would they rather have developers, for example? building a project that hasn't been fully specced yet or sitting on their thumbs or you know fixing and refactoring some other stuff that needs it you know take some stuff off the wish list or um, would they rather have the developers go help plan those projects uh, even though it's not what they do every day yeah or maybe that means something like your your infrastructure team has to be or your whole application in general might need to be more modularized so that if the infrastructure layer one in one module is down, it's not blocking everything else. Yeah. yeah. They, an architectural issue. Yeah. yeah. Kanban, Kanban, one of the promises I guess you'd say of Kanban is that it'll help expose problems. It doesn't have a solution for everything, but it, it will at least tell you, hey, you know what, Team X is going to run out of stuff to do soon because their buffer is, is below the threshold of, uh, of where they want it to be. Um, so they've got their release column over on the far side. And then in this particular display, they move closed, done tasks down to the bottom, so they uh, they don't get visually in the way of um, of what you're seeing above. Sure. The last thing you said was really really important um, that it exposes the problems. Um, in my experience doing this or or Scrum or other forms of management places, a lot of times when those problems come up then people will say, oh, this is just not working because we have these unknowns that make it so that now our people are sitting around and they got to wait for two days for no work to do. We've got to change you know, that to waterfall because that's what we know best. <laughs> and what they don't realize is that when they were on waterfall, it was hiding all those problems that were there anyway. So it just made them feel better, but it wasn't actually better. Yeah. And so you don't want to go away from it just because it told you that you have a problem. You want to leverage it and let it, you, let it teach you about your problems so you can get it fixed. That's, That's a great point. point. When you first switch to Kanban, it'll make you uncomfortable because it'll expose that what you've been doing has some room for improvement. And uh, different people, different teams deal with that to differing degrees. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, for us, it's acted as an early warning system. Before we run out of work to do, we know that we're going to, uh, which gives us some help. Over here first and then in the middle. Um, it depends on your process. In ours, we have some specific rules about when to move back cards. But in this case, this is a really common one. If testing fails, it needs somewhere to go back to to get re-examined by the developers. Yeah. Yeah. The, the goal, goal is to get them from here to here, so avoiding having to take it back is great, but, you know, bugs happen, you know, so. This is a second question. So I understand that part of the difference between Kanban and Scrum is that this has, like, parallel development cycles. Of course, maybe Scrum has, like, a chance and explain it. But as far as prioritizing goes, who is in charge of prioritizing tasks? In our organization, we have a person who's in a role that's kind of a mix of product owner and project manager. Uh, our technical leads decide how we're going to build stuff, but they decide what we're going to build and what the priorities are. So, but yeah, you do absolutely need somebody who's, who's deciding priorities. Otherwise, if you just leave it to the developers, they'll just pick the ones they want to work on, and, you know, and that has varying results. Not necessarily, no. It's a, it's a tool that you can use with almost any organization. You can, um, 
and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute, but Kanban is a, a lot more flexible and a lot less strict than Scrum and some other methodologies are. So you can take principles from other methodologies and add them on top of Kanban. I've even seen Scrum teams that use Kanban to visualize how they're doing. Um, you know, they'll start out at the beginning of the sprint with everything in the to-do column, and by the end, everything will be in the done column. And, and that's how they do it. I, let's go to you first and then to the front row. Quick question. What is the name of this actual app? I'm not sure which app this came from. I, I got it from Google Image Search, so <laughs> this isn't actually one I've used. This was um, one to illustrate a point. When I do searches for um, Kanban tools on Google, there are a lot of different stuff. Right now, our team is using one that's built into Jira with their Greenhopper plugin. I've liked it quite a bit. Um, there are others that, you know, software tools that are strictly, we do nothing but Kanban. I would imagine that their stuff is probably pretty good. I haven't taken a, a deeper look at it. Um, but it is becoming more common to build something like this in. And, and like I said, you know, there are a lot of teams I know that still do manual. You know, they have a whiteboard and they go have their stand ups around that whiteboard every day. They make sure everything's up to date and, uh, and then everybody goes and and does their stuff coming by during the day to update things as, as things change. In the front here. In manufacturing, you've got a, a pull mechanism that I'm not seeing reflected here. For example, if you had uh, a slew of testers and the three UX testers are not working, then it would turn the in progress for development for UX red. Yeah. Um, does that happen in school? Yeah, yeah, so the, the pull that you see here um, mostly happens in the buffer columns between steps. So if the testers are going crazy and they're just knocking stuff out left and right, this coded column is going to start to get really small. I'm talking about pulling my business So for example, the UX testers are sitting on their thumbs while the, um, the back end testers are talking Oh, right. OK, so you've got different disciplines. So um, one of the things I'll talk about in a bit that helps a lot with that is called swim lanes. Um, and and I'll, uh, I'll show some examples of that. Uh, but yeah, you could do swim lanes, or if, if the disciplines are separate enough that there's not much overlap, you could do separate boards. Um, so, in fact, I'll talk about swim lanes now. Um, swim lanes are a feature that, um, completely optional, but most places, I think, seem to find them helpful. Basically, it's adding rows to your columns, where uh, you can divide out different things. Uh, a really common thing to have is a swim lane for super urgent stuff, you know, the expedite fast lane uh, swim lane. Um, in ours, we have a swim lane for things that aren't assigned to anybody because that's another red flag for us. We need to have somebody who's going to be working on this. Uh, we need to identify who it is. So uh, you can break it down by who's assigned to the task, who's working on it, what's the priority, uh, what project is it if your board has multiple, uh, multiple projects at once. If you, have, uh, if you have one team that's working on multiple different projects, that can be a useful way to divide it up. Um, electronic Kanban boards often have some expand and collapse features that help for, um, for each user of the board to get to the data that's most, um, most important for them. Another thing you might have noticed is color coding. Again, you know, it's another way to categorize it that's visually, it stands out, it jumps out at you. You can look at that board and see, wow, there's a lot of green on there. We've got a lot of new features we're building. Or there's a lot of red, which might mean urgent, it might mean bugs, it, you know, whatever. Whatever it is that, that you're using in your, uh, in your system. If you've got multiple different customers or clients, that can be a way to divide them out. Really, whatever you want. It's completely optional. But um, I think most places do use it for something, whether it's the type of work it is or, or the priority or whatever. You could even give each person a color for their tasks if, if you felt like it. Um, manual versus electronic. This one really can go either way. There are different pros and cons. Different teams need different things out of it. It can be really easy to get started with a manual board. You don't have to worry about picking out software or paying a monthly fee for a service that you're using. Just grab a whiteboard, whiteboard marker, draw some columns, label it whatever you want. And, and if you haven't tried Kanban, I recommend that's probably a good way to start out um, unless you've found a tool that you're already interested in using. But um, at the beginning, as you're solidifying, you know, what are the steps that we want on our board? What are the columns we need? I would recommend just doing it in whiteboard marker or something simple to, to change because it'll happen. 
Um, <clears throat> as you get more established, I've seen a lot of groups use uh, stuff like electrical tape to make their columns a little more permanent and, uh, and stuff like that. I've even seen some that will use a Sharpie or a permanent marker on their whiteboard to put some of the labels on the board and then they'll use alcohol to erase them with if they ever need to move them. But then your labels and your lines don't get erased when you move around your stuff and, and move places from, move things from one spot to another. Uh, the, yeah. Um, sometimes you do end up breaking out new tasks. That most often happens in the design phase, but it sometimes happens in the development phase also, where you find that something's going to be a lot bigger deal than it sounded like, and or you find some bug that you've got to go fix. Um, usually for us, I see that our, you know, they always have some kind of identifier, a number, whatever, and then they've got the title of the task, you know, what is it. For most things, that's usually sufficient on the board to be able to see what's where, um, but usually it goes along with something else that has all the additional details. Either you've got a shared repository where everyone can go look up, oh, here's the folder for task number 357. I'm going to open it up, it's got all the stuff in it that I need, and that'll get built upon as, as the work goes on. Or um, in our case, where we're using Jira with its um, Greenhopper plugin, you know, it's our task tracker, and so it's our actual tasks that are in the system, bugs that get reported, whatever it is, that are showing up on our Kanban board. So if we click on those, we've got all the detail right there, which has been pretty convenient. So besides the manual ones, there's also a variety of electronic ones. They tend to be a lot easier to make wholesale changes to. You know, you can just say, oh, you know what, I'm going to make these categories instead, and it will stick stuff in the right place, or um, at least make it easier for you to dramatically change what you're doing. Uh, it's also a lot easier to automate an electronic board than a manual board. Uh, although I guess with robots you could, you know, have make something that would move your stickies for you. Might not be cost effective. Um, another nice thing about electronic is you can set up some rules. Um, any system that's designed for Kanban will, will guide you through stuff. Usually the interface is a drag and drop that I've seen. Grab that sticky, drop it over here and it will usually make you move it through a valid progression of columns. You can't just take it from design to testing or from development, you know, skip over QA and deploy it. Uh, but you can set up rules that, that it'll help you enforce about when you can go backwards, what, what can lead to what. Um, I haven't seen a set of Kanban tools that makes it really easy to import and export stuff between tools. So once you get a wealth of stuff built up in one Kanban board system, it's kind of hard to transfer that to something else. You can always switch and start using something else for the new stuff and just kind of finish out what's left. But uh, as far as like taking your history with you, if that's valuable to you, I haven't seen one that it's easy to do that with. Um, for us, you know, like I said, the integration with the task tracker was um, a key feature. So, so, at this point, are there any questions about what Kanban is or how it works? Yes. So, comparing it with the development model and where it's for like, it seems like the biggest difference is Kanban is more, you have a parallel development, and with Kanban, it's sort of not that way, it's done. Right. I'm actually getting to that very thing. It's interesting you mentioned that. Um, so we've mentioned some of the benefits of Kanban, right? There's, there's visibility, there's um, backlog management. You don't get really backed up because there's finite space on your board. Uh, by limiting the work in progress, we focus on fewer things at once, which helps improve our throughput. You can see the task progressing across the board. Um, it helps. And, and then, you know, there is a lot of flexibility over some of the other things. So let's compare uh, Kanban and Scrum. They're both agile. Uh, Scrum is focused around sprints. There are quite a few rules about how you do things and what you're supposed to do to be Scrum. And, uh, and Kanban is more focused, instead of on sprints, it's focused on continuous flow. Getting stuff done, and it has a lot fewer rules. 
If you look at a, a how-to scrum manual and a how-to Kanban manual, you'll find that the how-to scrum is probably four or five times as, as long as the list of how to Kanban. So Scrum wants you to have things that are like potentially releasable software at the end of every sprint. Uh, Kanban doesn't really have anything that corresponds to that. Uh, in short, it's a lot more flexible. It, it does give you a lot of the same benefits. Um, we actually were a Scrum team before we started Kanban. I, I think most teams that are using Kanban do start with, with Scrum. Um, we picked Scrum because it was popular. There's, There's got to be some reason, you know. There's a lot of hype about this. Let's let's go check it out. In our first year, we found that for us, it it had some issues that that we were having a hard time resolving. Most of our projects that we were working on were either um, too short, you know, it's uh, go add this functionality to feature X on system Y, or too long, you know, add on this whole new subsection to this app. Um, they never fit nicely in a sprint. We were doing two-week sprints. Our tasks were either two days or two months. Two days is way too short for a sprint. Two months is way too long. And so that was tricky. So what happened was our planning and our reviews didn't match up with the project. They, they were always um, you know, planning part of a project that's already in progress. Um, and reviewing, you know, doing a sprint review on a sprint that didn't really get a whole project done. Yeah, we could have said, yes, this is potentially reusable software. We're never going to because it only has two-thirds of the features we need. But, you know, I guess it's kind of, uh, it's kind of releasable. And then in our environment, we had things that changed rapidly. Lots of requests, urgent bug fixes, or urgent feature additions. So in practice, about 50% of what we finished in a sprint wasn't what we planned on doing by the time and when we started. That made, made it, it hard. And then, and then um, because, because of all those things combined, a lot of the meetings that we were having just weren't feeling very, uh, there wasn't a lot of satisfaction in the meetings. They're, they weren't very effective for us. So when we switched to a new task tracking system, we found that they had, in with their Scrum tools, they had these Kanban boards. Um, they offered them as a visibility tool for the sprint stuff, or you can just use Kanban. And so we started trying it. And um, overall, overall, for us, it's been a good fit. Some of the reasons why are that the emergencies use the system instead of going around it. That's been a big help. We don't have to keep telling customers that we're not starting their stuff for two weeks. That's never a good conversation. Uh, I have not yet met a customer that's happy to hear, we're going to start on that in two weeks. Um, you can tell them we're going to start on that in two days, and they still wouldn't be happy, but, but two weeks is a lot worse. Yeah. yeah. So we, we need your help. Can you wait two weeks before we do your stuff? No, no. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't go great. Last Wednesday. Yeah. Visibility and the ease of use has really helped our flow. We've got a diverse team. Everything from .NET developers and web developers and QA people and database administrators and project managers. It's, um, the visibility across the board has been really helpful. And, uh, and it's helped our design, dev, and QA teams stay busy, but not too much. You know, it very quickly becomes clear when somebody is running low on stuff to do. So a quick side note on planning. Um, Kanban doesn't express a stance on whether to just jump into coding or how much planning you're supposed to do first. For us, you know, what's worked well for us is that um, we like to nail down the plan as much as we can before we start work without taking it overboard. You know, if we've got a, a, a project we're expecting to be a month or two, we'll probably spend a couple of days on planning without building anything for it. Just to make sure that we've thought about everything and, and that we've got all the pieces identified. We identify all the tasks that we think are part of this project up front. Um, that has dramatically reduced our rework it's made, it's made our development, development faster because we don't have to second guess, wait, is this the right thing to do next? Wait, let me go review the plan. You know, all that's done ahead of time. It's improved our customer satisfaction because at the beginning in the planning stages, we really make sure that what we're planning to build matches up with what their need is. It's reduced our issues found in QA and it's shortened our overall cycle time from design to, to completion. Um, just some thoughts to throw out there. So how would you get started doing Kanban if you're not yet? Um, 
to identify the steps in your process, that's an important part. We like to insert, a, like I mentioned, a buffer step between different teams or different duties so that it's the input queue for one group and the output queue of another. Uh, then you make your board, manual, electronic, whatever, stick your tasks on the board, keep it updated. I would recommend at least daily, if not more often. Um, I, we found that our developers like moving stuff forward on the board. It's a sense of satisfaction. You know, gold star. All right, I got something done. It sounds dumb and cheesy, but it, it works, even when you know that that's exactly what it is. Um, and then use the board often. Um, I would recommend using it in your daily stand-ups. You know, it's a great way to see who worked on what yesterday, who's working on what tomorrow. Uh, and it really is kind of as simple as it sounds. Some of the questions you want to look at, do you want to go manual or electronic? And that might change as you go. Uh, where to stick your board, make sure it's visible. Make sure people are going to see it. I see a lot of them in big open areas or in conference rooms that you're in all the time. Uh, get your columns right. Make, make them match your process. And don't be afraid to change your board when you want to update your process. Decide if you want a fast lane. How do you want a colored code? Do you want to do swim lanes? Um, how do you show who's working on what? Because that's usually important. And then think about what you want your item limits to be in each column. Sometimes you can try it for a while and, and see. How do you take care of your Kanban board? Well, use it, update it. Um, you know, keep using it uh, for your stand-ups. It will add valuable information to your conversations. And then, uh, you know, be happy when you move stuff off, off the board and get it done. Are there any hurdles or, or problems that we haven't talked about that you might expect when you're trying Kanban? Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a, like a, an amazing elegant solution for that. Most of the time it's some kind of note on the task that says, you know, depends on or this task is blocking. Uh, you know, there are times where I prefer having what this task is blocking listed on the task that's there. That, that's like a red flag of, oh, this is higher priority because it's blocking other stuff. Um, rather than just saying this one can't move ahead. Sometimes you listen in both places. Yeah. yeah. Um, something that we use for that, uh, there's like these little stickies with the end that have like a color coded thing on there. And oh, yeah, yeah, the little flags. flags. We flag the, the sticky and then you put the thing that it's dependent on so we know oh, great. Look for that card. So. Yeah. yeah. That can be nice. I mean, something that's visual helps a lot on Kanban for identifying yeah. that. Yeah. So we have this kind of mass, but it seems to be like really large in the process. Yeah, it's really flexible. I think in every team that's using Kanban, there's always at least one person who's kind of a cheerleader of Kanban, who's a fan. You know, there's a reason why you guys started using it. Um, someone's in favor of it, and usually they end up being the one pushing stuff forward. I ended up being the de facto administrator of our task tracking system and and our Kanban boards and kind of dove in as like, oh, you know what, we should be using this Kanban thing. Let's see how to set it up. And so, you know, someone will end up in that role. It's not something that consumes a lot of time, but um, the more people you have kind of prodding it to, to keep getting used and, and to reflect reality on your board, um, you know, it'll help. But there's not a, like a Scrum Master equivalent role. You could take a Scrum Master and say, hey, you know, you're in charge of the Kanban board too. And he'll make sure that everybody's stuff's updated and that people are using it effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I, I should have put a picture in. I didn't get to. But um, there's a, a diagram called the cumulative flow diagram. Um, if you Google it, there are some great examples. Uh, the Jira tool that we use has it built in. Uh, electronic ones can do this. Uh, you could build one manually with just a, a regular board on paper by having someone go in and, and you know, count the number of tasks in each column once a day, for example, and then just plotting that over time. Um, but it shows you which steps are taking the longest. It, if you measure it this way, you can see how long a task takes to get from here to here. If you measure it this way, you can see how deep your backlog is in each area. Um, it's a, a pretty useful graph and a good visualization that you'll get with electronic Kanban boards. So.
I think that's it from what I've got. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Um, anything we missed? Anything else you guys want to talk about? I, yes, I'll have a link up momentarily on, uh, I think, what is it, uh, joined in that they're using. So yes, I will put this out. This is on um, rvl.io right now. So thank you. Thank you for coming. As we are